Basil, I said. I thought you made a leer last term. What are you doing in the stocks? He flushed a little, looking embarrassed. Kilvin caught me adding water to acid. I shook my head, giving a stern scowl. This is contrary to proper procedure, Elir Basil, I said, dropping my voice an octave. An artificer must move with perfect care in all things. Basil grinned. You've got his accent. He opened the ledger book. What can I get you? I'm not feeling up for anything more complicated than piecework right now, I said. How about... Hold on, Basil interrupted, frowning down at the ledger book. What? He spun the ledger around to face me and pointed. There's a note next to your name. I looked. Penciled in Kilvin's strangely childlike scrawl was, No materials or tools to Relark Volth. Send him to me, Kilvin. Basil gave me a sympathetic look. It's acid to water. He joked gently. Did you forget too? I wish I had, I said. Then I'd know what was going on. Basil looked around nervously, then leaned forward and spoke in a low voice. Listen, I saw that girl again. I blinked at him stupidly. What? The girl that came in here looking for you, he prompted. The young one that was looking for the red-headed wizard who sold her a charm? I closed my eyes and rubbed at my face. She came back? This is the last thing I need right now. Basil shook his head. She didn't come in, he said. At least, not that I know of. But I've seen her a couple times outside. She hangs around the courtyard. He jerked his head toward the southern exit of the fishery. Did you tell anyone? I asked. Basil looked profoundly offended. I wouldn't do that to you, he said. But she might have talked to someone else. You should really get rid of her. Kilvin will spit nails if he thinks you've been selling charms. I haven't been, I said. I've got no idea who she is. What does she look like? Young, Basil said with a shrug. Not sealedish. I think she had light hair. She wears a blue cloak with the hood up. I tried to walk over and talk to her, but she just ran away. I rubbed my forehead. Wonderful. Basil shrugged sympathetically. Just thought I'd warn you. If she actually comes in here and asks for you, I'll have to tell Kilvin. He grimaced apologetically. I'm sorry, but I'm in enough trouble as it is. I understand, I said. Thanks for the warning. When I walked into the workshop, I was immediately struck by a strange quality of the light in the room. The first thing I did was look up, checking to see if Kilvin had added a new lamp to the array of glass spheres hanging up among the rafters. I hoped the change in light was due to a new lamp. Kilvin's mood was always foul when one of his lamps went unexpectedly dark. Scanning the rafters, I didn't see any dark lamps. It took me a long moment to realize the strange quality of the light was due to actual sunlight slanting in through the low windows on the eastern wall. Normally, I didn't come to work until later in the day. The workshop was almost eerily quiet this early in the morning. The huge room seemed hollow and lifeless, with only a handful of students working on projects. That, combined with the odd light and the unexpected summons from Kilvin, made me rather uneasy as I crossed the room heading toward Kilvin's office. Despite the early hour, a small forge in the corner of Kilvin's office was already well stoked. Heat billowed past me as I stood in the open doorway. It felt good after the early winter chill outside. Kilvin stood with his back to me, working the bellows with a relentless rhythm. I knocked loudly on the frame of the door to get his attention. Master Kilvin? I just tried to check some materials out of stocks. Is anything the matter? Kilvin glanced over in my direction. Relark Hall, I will be a moment. Come in. I stepped into his office and swung the heavy door closed behind me. If I was in trouble, I'd rather not have anyone listening in. Kilvin continued to work the bellows for a long moment. It was only when he drew out a long tube that I realized it wasn't a forge he was firing. 
It was a small glasswork. Moving deftly, he drew out a blob of molten glass on the end of his tube, then proceeded to blow an increasingly large bubble of glass. After a minute, the glass lost its orange glow. Bellows, Kilvin said without looking at me, putting the tube back into the mouth of the glasswork. I scrambled to obey, working the bellows in a steady rhythm until the glass was glowing orange again. Kilvin motioned me to stop, pulled it out, and puffed at the tube for another long moment, spinning the glass until the bubble was large as a sweet melon. He set it back in the glasswork again, and I pumped the bellows without being asked. By the third time we repeated this, I was wringing with sweat. I wished I hadn't closed Kilvin's door, but I didn't want to leave the bellows for the time it would take for me to open it again. Kilvin didn't seem to notice the heat. The glass bubble grew large as my head, then big as a pumpkin. But the fifth time he drew it from the heat and began to blow, it sagged on the end of the tube, deflating and falling to the floor. Kissed Kyle on coat! He swore furiously. He threw down the metal tube where it rang sharply against the stone floor. Climb it, brevet and iron! I fought down the sudden urge to laugh. My Ciara wasn't perfect, but I was fairly certain Kilvin had said shit in God's beard. The bear-like master stood for a long moment looking down at the ruined glass on the floor. Then he let out a long, irritated breath through his nose, pulled off his goggles, and turned to look at me. Three sets of synchronized bells, brass, he said without preamble. One tap and catch, iron. Four heat funnels, iron. Six siphons, tin. Twenty-two panes of twice-tough glass and other assorted piecework. It was a list of all the work I had done this term in the fishery. Simple things I could finish and sell back to stocks for a quick profit. Kilvin looked at me with his dark eyes. Does this work please you, Relark Wolf? The projects are easy enough, Master Kilvin, I said. You are now a Relar, he said, his voice heavy with reproach. Are you content to coast idly, making toys for the lazy rich? He asked. Is that what you desire from your time in the fishery? Easy work? I could feel the sweat beating up in my hair and running down my back. I'm somewhat leery of venturing off on my own, I said. You didn't particularly approve of the modifications I made to my hand lamp. Those are coward's words, Kilvin said. You will never leave the house because you were scolded once? He looked at me. I ask you again. Bells? Castings? Does this work please you, Relark Wolf? The thought of paying next term's tuition pleases me, Master Kilvin. Sweat was running down my face. I tried to wipe it away with my sleeve, but my shirt was already soaked through. I glanced at Kilvin's office door. And the work itself? Kilvin prompted. There was sweat beating on the dark skin of his forehead, but he didn't seem otherwise bothered by the heat. Truthfully, Master Kilvin? I asked, feeling a little lightheaded. He looked a bit offended. I value truth in all things, Relark Foth. The truth is, I've made eight deck lamps this last year, Master Kilvin. If I have to make another, I expect I might shit myself from pure boredom. Kilvin huffed something that could have been a laugh, then smiled widely at me. Good. That is how a Relar should feel. He pointed one thick finger at me. You are clever, and you have good hands. I expect great things from you, not drudgery. Make something clever, and it will earn you more than a lamp. Certainly more than piecework. Leave that to the Ilir. He gestured dismissively at the window that looked out over the workshop. I'll do my best, Master Kilvin, I said. My voice sounded strange to my own ears, distant and tinny. Do you mind if I open the door and get some fresh air in here? Kilvin grunted in agreement, and I took a step toward the door. But my legs felt loose, and my head spun. I staggered and almost fell headlong onto the floor, but I managed to catch the edge of the work table and merely went to my knees instead. 
When my bruised knees hit the stone floor, it was excruciating, but I didn't shout or cry out. In fact, the pain seemed to be coming from a long way off. I awoke, confused, with a mouth as dry as sawdust. My eyes were gummy, and my thoughts so sluggish, it took me a long moment to recognize the distinctive antiseptic tang in the air. That, combined with the fact that I was lying naked under a sheet, let me know I was in the Medica. I turned my head and saw short blonde hair and the dark physicer's uniform. I relaxed back onto the pillow. Hello, Mola, I croaked. She turned and gave me a serious look. Both? She said formally. How do you feel? Still bleary. I had to think about it. Thick, I said. Then, thirsty. Mola brought me a glass and helped me drink. It was sweet and gritty. It took me a long moment to finish it, but by the time I was done, I felt halfway human again. What happened? I asked. You fainted in the artificery, she said. Kilvin carried you over here himself. It was rather touching, actually. I had to shoo him away. I felt my entire body flush with shame at the thought of being carried through the streets of the university by the huge master. I must have looked like a rag doll in his arms. I fainted? Kilvin explained you were in a hot room, Mola said. And you'd sweat through your clothes. You were dripping wet. She gestured to where my shirt and pants lay wadded on the table. Heat exhaustion? I said. Mola held up a hand to quiet me. That was my first diagnosis, she said. On further examination, I've decided you're actually suffering from an acute case of jumping out of a window last night. She gave me a pointed look. I suddenly became self-conscious. Not of my near nakedness, but of the obvious injuries I'd received when I'd fallen off the roof of the Golden Pony. I glanced at the door and was relieved to see it was closed. Mola stood watching me, her expression carefully blank. Has anyone else seen? I asked. Mola shook her head. We've been busy today. I relaxed a bit. That's something, then. Her expression was grim. This morning, Arwell gave orders to report any suspicious injuries. It's no secret why. Ambrose himself has offered a sizable reward to whoever helps him catch a thief who broke into his rooms and stole several valuables, including a ring his mother gave him on her deathbed. That bastard, I said hotly. I didn't steal anything. Mola raised an eyebrow. As easy as that? No denial? No anything? I exhaled through my nose, trying to get my temper under control. I'm not going to insult your intelligence. It's pretty obvious I didn't fall down some stairs. I took a deep breath. Look, Mola, if you tell anyone, they'll expel me. I didn't steal anything. I could have, but I didn't. Then why... She hesitated, obviously uncomfortable. Yes, yes. What were you doing? I sighed. Would you believe I was doing a favor for a friend? Mola gave me a shrewd look, her green eyes searching mine. Well, you do seem to be in the favor business lately. I... What? I asked, my thoughts moving too sluggishly to follow what she was saying. The last time you were here, I treated you for burns and smoke inhalation after pulling Fella out of a fire. Oh, I said. That's not really a favor. Anyone would have done that. Mola gave me a searching look. You really believe that, don't you? She shook her head a little, then picked up a hardback and made a few notes on it, no doubt filling out her treatment report. Well, I consider it a favor. Fella and I bunked together back when we were both new here. Despite what you think, it's not something a lot of people would have done. There was a knock and Sim's voice came from the hallway. Can we come in? Without waiting for an answer, he opened the door and led an uncomfortable-looking Willem into the room. We heard... Sim paused and turned to look at Mola. He's going to be okay, right? 
He'll be fine, Mola said, provided his temperature levels out. She picked up a key gauge and stuck it in my mouth. I know this will be hard for you, but try to keep your mouth shut for a minute. In that case, Simmons said with a grin, we heard Kilvin took you somewhere private and showed you something that made you faint like a little sissy girl. I scowled at him, but kept my mouth shut. Mola turned back to Will and Sim. His legs are going to hurt for a while, but there's no permanent damage. His elbow should be fine too, though the stitching's a mess. What the hell were you guys doing in Ambrose's rooms anyway? Willem simply looked at her, characteristically dark-eyed and stoic. No such luck with Sim. Quoth needed to get a ring for his lady love, he chirped cheerfully. Mola turned to look at me, her expression furious. You have a hell of a lot of nerve to lie right to my face, she said, her eyes flat and angry as a cat's. Thank goodness you didn't want to insult my intelligence or anything. I took a deep breath and reached up to take the key gauge out of my mouth. God damn it, Sim, I said crossly. Someday I'm going to teach you to lie. Sim looked back and forth between the two of us, flushed with panic and embarrassment. Quoth has a thing for a girl over the river he said defensively. Ambrose took a ring of hers and won't give it back. We just... Mola cut him off with a sharp gesture. Why didn't you just tell me that? She demanded of me, irritated. Everyone knows what Ambrose is like with women. That's why I didn't tell you, I said. It sounded like a very convenient lie. There's also the fact that it's not one whit of your goddamn business. Her expression hardened. You come off pretty high and mighty for... Stop! Just stop, Willem said, startling both of us out of our argument. He turned to Mola. When Kvothe came here unconscious, what did you do first? I checked his pupils for signs of head trauma, Mola said automatically. What the hell does that have to do with anything? Willem gestured in my direction. Look at his eyes now. Mola looked at me. They're dark, she said, sounding surprised. Dark green, like a pine bough. Will continued. Don't argue with him when his eyes go dark like that. No good comes of it. It's like the noise a rattlesnake makes, Sim said. More like hackles on a dog, Willem corrected. It shows when he's ready to bite. All of you can go straight to hell, I said. Or you can give me a mirror so I can see what you're talking about. I don't care which. Will ignored me. Our little Quoth has a flash pan temper, but once he's had a minute to cool down, he will realize the truth. Willem gave me a pointed look. He's not upset because you didn't trust him, or that you tricked Sim. He's upset because you found out what asinine lengths he is willing to go to in order to impress a woman. He looked at me. Is asinine the right word? I took a deep breath and let it out. Pretty much, I admitted. I chose it because it sounded like ass, Will said. I knew you two had to be involved, Mola said with a hint of apology in her voice. Honestly, the three of you are thick as thieves, and I do mean that in all its various clever implications. She walked around the side of the bed and looked critically at my wounded elbow, which one of you stitched him up? Me, Sim grimaced. I know I made a mess of it. Mess would be generous, Mola said, looking it over critically. It looks like you were trying to stitch your name onto him and kept misspelling it. I think he did quite well, Will said, meeting her eye. Considering his lack of training and the fact that he was helping a friend under less than ideal circumstances. Mola flushed. I didn't mean it like that, she said quickly. Working here, it's easy to forget that not everyone... She turned to Sim. I'm sorry. Sim ran his hand through his sandy hair. I suppose you could make it up to me sometime, he said, grinning boyishly. Like, maybe tomorrow afternoon, when you let me buy you lunch? He looked at her hopefully. Mola rolled her eyes and sighed, somewhere between amusement and exasperation. Fine. My work here is done, Will said gravely. I'm leaving. 
I hate this place. Thanks, Will, I said. He gave a perfunctory wave over one shoulder and closed the door behind him. Mola agreed to leave mention of my suspicious injuries off her report and stuck to her original diagnosis of heat exhaustion. She also cut away Sim's stitches, then re-cleaned, re-sewed, and re-bandaged my arm. Not a pleasant experience, but I knew it would heal more quickly under her experienced care. In closing, she advised me to drink more water, get some sleep, and suggested that in the future I refrain from strenuous physical activity in a hot room the day after falling off a roof. Chapter 22 Slipping Up until this point in the term, Elksadal had been teaching us theory and adept sympathy. How much light could be produced from ten thalms of continuous heat using iron, using basalt, using human flesh? We memorized tables of figures and learned how to calculate escalating squares, angular momentum, and compounded degradations. Simply said, it was mind-numbing. Don't get me wrong, I knew it was essential information. Bindings of the sort we'd shown Denna were simple, but when things grew complicated, a skilled sympathist needed to do some fairly tricky calculations. In terms of energy, there isn't much difference between lighting a candle and melting it into a puddle of tallow. The only difference is one of focus and control. When the candle is sitting in front of you, these things are easy. You simply stare at the wick and stop pouring in heat when you see the first flicker of flame. But if the candle is a quarter mile away, or in a different room, focus and control are exponentially more difficult to maintain. And there are worse things than melted candles waiting for a careless sympathist. The question Denna had asked in the Aeolian was all important. Where does the extra energy go? As Will had explained, some went into the air, some went into the linked items, and the rest went into the sympathist's body. The technical term for it was thalmic overfill, but even Elksadal tended to refer to it as slippage. Every year or so, some careless sympathist with a strong alar channeled enough heat through a bad link to spike his body temperature and drive himself fever mad. Dahl told us of one extreme case where a student managed to cook himself from the inside out. I mentioned the last of Manette the day after Dahl shared the story with our class. I expected him to join me in some healthy scoffing, but it turned out Manette had actually been a student back when it had happened. Smelled like pork, Manette said grimly. Damnedest thing. Felt bad for him, of course, but you can only feel so much pity for an idiot. A little slippage here and there you hardly notice, but he must have slipped 200,000 thalms inside two seconds. Manette shook his head not looking up from the piece of tin he was engraving. Whole wing of mains reeked. Nobody could use those rooms for a year. I stared at him. Thermal slippage is fairly common, though, Manette continued. Now kinetic slippage... He raised his eyebrows appreciatively. Twenty years back, some damn fool Elthe got drunk and tried to lift a manure cart onto the roof of the master's hall on a bet tore his own arm off at the shoulder. Manette bent back over his piece of tin, engraving a careful rune. Takes a special kind of stupid to do something like that. The next day, I was especially attentive to what Dahl had to say. He drilled us mercilessly. Calculations for enthalpy. Charts showing distance of decay. Equations that describe the entropic curves a skilled sympathist needs to understand on an almost instinctive level. But Dahl was no fool. So before we grew bored and sloppy, he turned it into a competition. He made us draw heat from odd sources, from red-hot irons, from blocks of ice, from our own blood. Lighting candles in distant rooms was the easiest of it. Lighting one of a dozen identical candles was harder. Lighting a candle you'd never actually seen in an unknown location, it was like juggling in the dark. There were contests of precision, contests of finesse, contests of focus and control. After two span, I was the highest ranked student in our class of 23 Rilar. Fenton nipped at my heels in second place. As luck would have it, 
the day after my assault on Ambrose's rooms, was the same day we began dueling in adept sympathy. Dueling required all the subtlety and control of our previous competitions, with the added challenge of having another student actively opposing your alar. So, despite my recent trip to the Medica for heat exhaustion, I melted a hole through a block of ice in a distant room. Despite two nights of scant sleep, I raised the temperature of a pint of mercury exactly ten degrees. Despite my throbbing bruises and the stinging itch of my bandaged arm, I tore the king of spades in half while leaving the other cards in the deck untouched. All of these things I did in less than two minutes, despite the fact that Fenton set the whole of his alar to oppose me. It is not for nothing that they came to call me Quoth the Arcane. My alar was like a blade of Ramston steel. It's rather impressive, Dal said to me after class. It's been years since I've had a student go undefeated for so long. Will anyone even bet against you anymore? I shook my head. That dried up a long time ago. The price of fame, Dal smiled, then looked a little more serious. I wanted to warn you before I announce it to the class. Next span, I'll probably start setting students against you in pairs. I'll have to go against Fenton and Bray at the same time? I asked. Dahl shook his head. We'll start with the two lowest-ranked duelists. It will be a nice lead-in to the teamwork exercises we'll be doing later in the term. He smiled. And it will keep you from growing complacent. Dahl gave me a sharp look, his smile fading. Are you all right? Just a chill, I said unconvincingly as I shivered. Could we go stand by the brazier? I stood as close as I could without pressing myself against the hot metal, spreading my hands over the glimmering bowl of hot coals. After a moment, the chill passed, and I noticed Dahl looking at me curiously. I ended up in the Medica with a bit of heat exhaustion earlier today, I admitted. My body's just a bit confused. I'm fine now. He frowned. You shouldn't come to class if you aren't feeling well, he said. And you certainly shouldn't be dueling. Sympathy of this sort stresses the body and mind. You shouldn't risk compounding that with an illness. I felt fine when I came to class, I lied. My body's just reminding me I owed a good night's sleep. See that you give it one, he said sternly, spreading his own hands to the fire. If you drive yourself too hard, you'll pay for it later. You've been looking a little ragged lately. Ragged isn't the right word, really. Weary, I guessed. Yes, weary. He eyed me speculatively, smoothing his beard with a hand. You have a gift for words. It's one of the reasons you ended up with Elodin, I expect. I didn't say anything to that. I must have said it quite loudly, too, because Dahl gave me a curious look. How are your studies progressing with Elodin? He asked casually. Well enough, I hedged. He looked at me. Not as well as I might hope, I admitted. Studying with Master Elodin isn't what I expected. <laughs> Dahl nodded. He can be difficult. A question sprang up in me. Do you know any names, Master Dahl? He nodded solemnly. What are they? I pressed. He stiffened slightly, then relaxed as he turned his hands back and forth over the fire. That isn't really a polite question, he said gently. Well, not impolite. It's just the sort of question you don't ask. Like asking a man how often he makes love to his wife. I'm sorry. No need to be, he said. There's no reason for you to know. It's a holdover from older times, I think. Back when we had more to fear from our fellow arcanists. If you knew what names your enemy knew, you could guess his strengths, his weaknesses. We were both silent for a moment, warming ourselves by the coals. Fire, he said after a long moment. I know the name of fire and one other. Only two? I blurted without thinking. And how many do you know? He mocked me gently. 
Yes, only two. But two is a great number of names to know these days. Elodin says it was different long ago. How many does Elodin know? Even if I knew, it would be exceptionally bad form for me to tell you that. He said with a hint of disapproval. But it's safe to say he knows a few. Could you show me something with the name of fire? I asked. If that's not inappropriate. Dal hesitated for a moment, then smiled. He looked intently into the brazier between us, closed his eyes, then gestured to the unlit brazier across the room. Fire. He spoke the word like a commandment, and the distant brazier roared up in a pillar of flame. Fire. I said, puzzled. That's it. The name of fire is fire. Alxadal smiled and shook his head. That's not what I actually said. Some part of you just filled in a familiar word. My sleeping mind translated it. Sleeping mind? He gave me a puzzled look. That's what Elodin calls the part of us that knows names. I explained. Dal shrugged and ran a hand over his short black beard. Call it what you will. The fact that you heard me say anything is probably a good sign. I don't know why I'm bothering with naming sometimes. I groused. I could have lit that brazier with sympathy. Not without a link. Dal pointed out. Without a binding, a source of energy. It still seems pointless. I said. I learn things every day in your class, useful things. I don't have a thing to show for all the time I've spent on naming. Yesterday, you know what he loaded and lectured about? Dal shook his head. The difference between being naked and being nude. I said flatly. Dal burst into laughter. I'm serious. I fought to be in his class, but now all I can do is think about all the time I'm wasting there, time I could be spending on more practical things. There are things more practical than names, Dal admitted. But watch. He focused on the brazier in front of us again, then his eyes grew distant. He spoke again, whispering this time, then slowly lowered his hand until it was inches above the hot coals. Then, with an intent expression on his face, Dal pressed his hand deep into the heart of the fire, nestling his spread fingers into the orange coals as if they were nothing more than loose gravel. I realized I was holding my breath and let it out softly, not wanting to break his concentration. Wow. Names, Dal said firmly and drew his hand back out of the fire. It was smudged with white ash, but perfectly unharmed. Names reflect true understanding of a thing, and when you truly understand a thing, you have power over it. But fire isn't a thing unto itself. I protested. It's merely an exothermal chemical reaction. It. I spluttered to a stop. Dahl drew in a breath, and for a moment, it looked as if he would explain. Then he laughed instead, shrugging helplessly. I don't have the wit to explain it to you. Ask Elodin. He's the one who claims to understand these things. I just work here. After Dahl's class, I made my way over the river to Imre. I didn't find Denna at the inn where she was staying, so I headed to the Aeolian, despite the fact that I knew it was too early to find her there. There were barely a dozen people inside, but I did see a familiar face at the far end of the bar talking to Stanchion. Count Threp waved, and I walked over to join them. Quoth, my boy," Threp said enthusiastically. "I haven't seen you in a mortal age. Things have been rather hectic on the other side of the river," I said, setting down my loot case. Stanchion looked me over. "You look it," he said frankly. You look pale. You should get more red meat or sleep. He pointed to a nearby stool. Barring that, I'll stand you a mug of methagnon. I'll thank you for that. I said, climbing onto a stool. It felt wonderful to take the weight off my aching legs. If it's meat and sleep you need, 
Threp said ingratiatingly. You should come to dinner at my estate. I promise wonderful food and conversation so dull you can drowse straight through it and not worry about missing a thing. He gave me an imploring look. Come now. I'll beg if I must. It won't be more than ten people. I've been dying to show you off for months now. I picked up the mug of metheglum and looked at Threp. His velvet jacket was a royal blue, and his suede boots were dyed to match. I couldn't show up for a formal dinner at his home dressed in second-hand road clothes, which were the only sort I owned. There was nothing ostentatious about Threp, but he was a noble born and raised. It probably didn't even occur to him that I didn't have any fine clothes. I didn't blame him for assuming that. The vast majority of the students at the university were at least modestly wealthy. How else could they afford tuition? The truth was, I'd like nothing better than a fine dinner and the chance to interact with some of the local nobility. I'd love to banter over drinks, repair some of the damage Ambrose had done to my reputation, and maybe catch the eye of a potential patron. But I simply couldn't afford the price of admission. A suit of passably fine clothes would cost at least a talent and a half, even if I bought them from a fripperer. Clothes do not make the man, but you need the proper costume if you want to play the part. Sitting behind Threp, Stanchion made an exaggerated nodding motion with his head. I'd love to come to dinner, I said to Threp. I promise, just as soon as things settle down a bit over at the university. Excellent, Threp said enthusiastically. I'm going to hold you to it, too. No backing out. I'll get you a patron, my boy. A proper one, I swear it. Behind him, Stancha nodded approvingly. I smiled at both of them and took another drink of metheglin. I glanced at the stairway to the second tier. Stancha saw my look. She's not here, he said apologetically. Haven't seen her in a couple days, actually. A handful of people came through the door of the Aeolian and shouted something in Yilish. Stanchion waved at them and got to his feet. Duty calls, he said, wandering off to greet them. Speaking of patrons, I said to Threp, there's something I've been wanting to ask your opinion about. I lowered my voice. Something I'd rather you kept between the two of us. Threp's eyes glittered curiously as he leaned close. I took another drink of metheglin while I gathered my thoughts. The drink was hitting me more quickly than I'd expected. It was quite nice, actually, as it dulled the ache of my many injuries. I'm guessing you know most every potential patron within a hundred miles of here. Rep shrugged, not bothering with false modesty. A fair number. Everyone who's earnest about it. Everyone with money, anyway. I have a friend, I said. A musician who is just starting out. She has natural talent, but not much training. Someone has approached her with an offer of help and a promise of eventual patronage. I trailed off, not sure how to explain the rest. Threp nodded. You want to know if he's a legitimate sort, he said. Reasonable concern. Some folk feel a patron has a right to more than music. He gestured to Stanchion. If you want stories... Ask him about the time that Duchess Samista came here on holiday. He gave a chuckle that was almost a moan, rubbing at his eyes. Tiny gods help me, that woman was terrifying. That's my worry, I said. I don't know if he's trustworthy. I can ask around if you like, the rep said. What's his name? That's part of the issue, I said. I don't know his name. I don't think she knows it either. Threp frowned at this. How can she not know his name? He gave her a name, I said, but she doesn't know if it's real. Apparently, he's particular about his privacy and gave her strict instructions never to tell anyone about him, I said. They never meet in the same place twice, never in public. He's gone for months at a time. I looked up at Threp. How does that sound to you? Well, it's hardly ideal, Threp said. Disapproval heavy in his voice. There's every chance this fellow isn't a proper patron at all. It sounds like he might be taking advantage of your friend. I nodded glumly. That was my thought, too. Then again, 
Threp said. Some patrons do work in secret. If they find someone with talent, it's not unknown for them to nurture them in private, and then... He made a dramatic flourish with one hand. It's like a magic trick. You suddenly produce a brilliant musician out of thin air. Threp gave me a fond smile. I thought that's what someone had done with you, he admitted. You came out of nowhere and got your pipes. I thought someone had been keeping you hidden away until you were ready to make your grand appearance. I hadn't thought of that, I said. It does happen, Threp said. But strange meeting places and the fact that she's not sure of his name. He shook his head, frowning. If nothing else, it's rather indecorous. Either this fellow is having a bit of fun pretending to be an outlaw, or he's genuinely dodgy. Threp seemed to think for a moment, tapping his fingers on the bar. Tell your friend to be careful and keep her wits about her. It's a terrible thing when a patron takes advantage of a woman. That's a betrayal. But I've known men who did little but pose as patrons to gain a woman's trust. He frowned. That's worse. I was halfway back to the university, with Stonebridge just beginning to loom in the distance, when I began to feel an unpleasant prickling heat run up my arm. At first, I thought it was the pain of the twice-stitched cuts on my elbow, as they'd been itching and burning all day. But instead of fading, the heat continued to spread up my arm and along the left side of my chest. I began to sweat, as if from a sudden fever. I stripped off my cloak, letting the chill air cool me and began to unbutton my shirt. The autumn breeze helped, and I fanned myself with my cloak, but the heat grew more intense, painful even, as if I'd spilled boiling water across my chest. Luckily, this section of road ran parallel to a stream that fed into the nearby Omethi River. Unable to think of a better plan, I kicked off my boots, unshouldered my loot, and jumped into the water. The chill of the stream made me gasp and sputter, but it cooled my burning skin. I stayed there, trying not to feel like an idiot while a young couple walked past, holding hands and pointedly ignoring me. The strange heat moved through my body, like there was a fire inside me trying to find a way out. It started along my left side, then wandered down to my legs, then back up to my left arm. When it moved to my head, I ducked underwater. It stopped after a few minutes, and I climbed out of the stream. Shivering, I wrapped myself in my cloak, glad no one else was on the road. Then, since there was nothing else to do, I shouldered my loot case and began the long walk back to the university, dripping wet and terribly afraid. Chapter 23 Principles I did tell Mola, I said as I shuffled the cards. She said it was all in my head and pushed me out the door. Well, I can only guess what that feels like, Sim said bitterly. I looked up surprised by the uncharacteristic sharpness in his voice. But before I could ask what was the matter, Willem caught my eye and shook his head, warning me away. Knowing Sim's history, I guessed it was another quick, painful end to another quick, painful relationship. I kept my mouth shut and dealt another hand of breath. The three of us were killing time, waiting for the room to fill up before I started playing for my typical felling night crowd at Anchor's. What do you think is the matter? Willem asked. I hesitated, worried that if I spoke my fears aloud, it might somehow make them true. I might have exposed myself to something dangerous in the fishery. Will looked at me. Such as? Some of the compounds we use, I said. They'll go straight through your skin and kill you in 18 slow ways. I thought back to the day my tentin glass had cracked in the fishery of the single drop of transporting agent that had landed on my shirt. It was only a tiny drop, barely larger than the head of a nail. I was so certain it hadn't touched my skin. I hope that's not it, but I don't know what else it might be. It could be a lingering effect from the plumb bob, Sim said grimly. Ambrose isn't much of an alchemist, and from what I understand, one of the main ingredients is lead. If he factored it himself, some latent principles could be affecting your system. Did you eat or drink anything different today? I thought about it. I had a fair bit of metheglin at the Aeolian, I admitted. That stuff will make anyone ill, Will said darkly. 
I like it, Sim said. But it's practically a nostrum all by itself. There's a lot of different tincturing going on in there. Nothing alchemical, but you've got nutmeg, thyme, clove, all manner of spices. Could be that one of them triggered some of the free principles lurking in your system. Wonderful, I grumbled. And how do I go about fixing that exactly? Sim spread his hands helplessly. That's what I thought, I said. Still, it sounds better than metal poisoning. Simon proceeded to take four tricks in a row with a clever card force, and by the end of the hand, he was smiling again. Sim was never really given to extended brooding. Will squared his cards away, and I pushed my chair back from the table. Play the one about the drunk cow and the butter churn, Sim said. I couldn't help but crack a smile. Maybe later, I said, as I picked up my increasingly shabby loot case and made my way to the hearth amid the sound of scattered, familiar applause. It took me a long moment to open the case, untwisting the copper wire I was still using in place of a buckle. For the next two hours, I played. I sang Copper Bottom Pot, Lilac Bow, and Aunt Emmy's Tub. The audience laughed and clapped and cheered. As I fingered my way through the songs, I felt my worries slough away. My music has always been the best remedy for my dark moods. As I sang, even my bruises seemed to pain me less. Then I felt a chill, as if a strong winter wind was blowing down the chimney behind me. I fought off a shiver and finished the last verse of Applejack, which I'd finally played to keep Sim happy. When I struck the last chord, the crowd applauded and conversation slowly welled up to fill the room again. I looked behind me at the fireplace, but the fire was burning cheerfully with no sign of a draft. I stepped down off the hearth, hoping a little walk would chase my chill away. But as soon as I took a few steps, I realized that wasn't the case. The cold settled straight into my bones. I turned back to the fireplace, spreading my hands to warm them. Will and Sim appeared at my side. What's going on? Sim asked. You look like you're going to be sick. Something like that, I said, clenching my teeth to keep them from chattering. Go tell Anchor I'm feeling ill and have to cut it short tonight. Then light a candle off this fire and bring it up to my room. I looked up at their serious faces. Will, can you help me get out of here? I don't want to make a scene. Willem nodded and gave me his arm. I leaned on him and concentrated on keeping my body from shaking as we made our way to the stairs. No one paid us much attention. I probably looked more drunk than anything. My hands were numb and heavy. My lips felt icy cold. After the first flight of stairs, I couldn't keep my shaking under control any longer. I could still walk, but the thick muscles in my legs twitched with every step. Will stopped. We should go the Medica. While he didn't sound different, his sealedish accent was thicker and he was starting to drop words, a sign he was genuinely worried. I shook my head firmly and leaned forward, knowing he'd have to help me up the stairs or let me fall. Willem put an arm around me and half-steadied, half-carried me the rest of the way. Once in my tiny room, I staggered onto the bed. Will wrapped a blanket around my shoulders. There were footsteps in the hallway, and Sim peered nervously around the door. He held a stub of candle, sheltering the flame with his other hand as he walked. I've got it. What do you want it for, anyway? There. I pointed to the table beside the bed. You lit it off the fire? Sim's eyes were frightened. Your lips, he said. They're not a good color. I pried a splinter from the rough wood of the bedside table and jabbed it hard into the back of my hand. Blood welled up and I rolled the long splinter around in it, getting it wet. Close the door, I said. You are not doing what I think you're doing, Sim said firmly. I jabbed the long splinter down into the soft wax of the candle alongside the burning wick. It sputtered a little bit, then the flame wrapped around it. I muttered two bindings, one right after the other, speaking slowly so my numb lips didn't slur the words. What are you doing? Sim demanded. Are you trying to cook yourself? When I didn't answer him, he stepped forward as if he would knock the candle over. 
Will caught his arm. His hands are like ice, he said quietly. He's cold. Really cold. Sim's eyes darted nervously between the two of us. He took a step back. Just, just be careful. But I was already ignoring him. I closed my eyes and bound the candle flame to the fire downstairs. Then I carefully made the second connection between the blood on the splinter and the blood in my body. It was very much like what I'd done with the drop of wine at the Aeolian, with the obvious exception that I didn't want my blood to boil. At first, it was just a brief tickle of heat, not nearly enough. I concentrated harder and felt my entire body relax as warmth flooded through me. I kept my eyes closed, keeping my attention on the bindings until I could take several long, deep breaths without any shuddering or shaking. I opened my eyes and saw my two friends looking on expectantly. I smiled at them. I'm okay. But before I got the words out, I began to sweat. I was suddenly too warm, nauseatingly warm. I broke both bindings as quickly as you jerk your hand away from a hot iron stove. I took a few deep breaths, then got to my feet and walked over to the window. I opened it and leaned heavily on the sill, enjoying the chill autumn air that smelled of dead leaves and coming rain. It was a long moment of silence. That looked like binders chills. Simmons said. Really bad binder's chills. It felt like the chills, I said. Maybe your body has lost the ability to regulate its own temperate, Will suggested. Temperature, Sim corrected him absently. That wouldn't account for the burn across my chest, I said. Sim cocked his head. Burn? I was wet with sweat now so I was glad for an excuse to unbutton my shirt and pull it off over my head. A large portion of my chest and upper arm was a bright red, a sharp contrast to my ordinarily pale skin. Mola said it was a rash, and I was being fussy as an old woman, but it wasn't there before I jumped into the river. Simon leaned close to look. I still think it's unbound principles, he said. They can do bizarre things to a person. We had an Allaire last term that wasn't careful with his factoring. He ended up not being able to sleep or focus his eyes for almost two span. Willem slouched into a chair. What makes a man cold, then hot, then cold again? Sim gave a half-hearted smile. Sounds like a riddle. I hate riddles, I said, reaching for my shirt. Then I yelped, clutching at the bare bicep of my left arm. Blood welled out between my fingers. Sim bolted to his feet, looking around frantically, obviously at a loss for what to do. It felt like I'd been stabbed by an invisible knife. God! Black and damn! I gritted out between my clenched teeth. I pulled my hand away and saw the small, round wound in my arm that had come from nowhere. Simmons' expression was horrified, his eyes wide, his hands covering his mouth. He said something, but I was too busy concentrating to listen. I already knew what he was saying anyway. Malfeasance. Of course. This was all malfeasance. Someone was attacking me. I lowered myself into the heart of stone and brought all my LR to bear. But my unknown attacker wasn't wasting any time. There was a sharp pain in my chest near the shoulder. It didn't break the skin this time, but I watched a blotch of dark blue blossom under my skin. I hardened my alar, and the next stab was little more than a pinch. Then, I quickly broke my mind into three pieces, and gave two of them the job of maintaining the alar that protected me. Only then did I let out a deep sigh. I'm fine. Simon gave a laugh that choked off into a sob. His hands still covered his mouth. How can you say that? He demanded, plainly horrified. I looked down at myself. Blood was still welling up through my fingers, running down the back of my hand and my arm. It's true, I said to him. Honestly, Sim. But malfeasance, he said. It just isn't done. I sat down on the edge of my bed, keeping pressure on my wound. I think we have some pretty clear proof otherwise. Willem sat back down. I am with Simon. I would never have believed this. He made an angry gesture. Orcanists do not do this anymore. It is insane. 
He looked at me. Why are you smiling? I'm relieved, I said honestly. I was worried I'd given myself cadmium poisoning, or I had some mysterious disease. This is just someone trying to kill me. How could someone do it? Simon asked. I don't mean morally. How did someone get hold of your blood or hair? Willem looked at Simon. What did you do with the bandages after you stitched him up? I burned them, Sim said defensively. I'm not an idiot. Will made a calming gesture. I'm just narrowing our options. It probably isn't the Medica either. They're careful about that sort of thing. Simmons stood up. We have to tell someone. He looked at Willem. Would Jameson still be in his office at this time of night? Sim, I said. How about we just wait for a while? What? Simmons said. Why? The only evidence I have are my injuries, I said. That means they'll want someone at the Medica to examine me. And when that happens... With one hand still clamped over my bloody arm, I waved my bandaged elbow. I looked remarkably like someone who fell off a roof just a couple days ago. Sim sat back down in his chair. It's only been three days, hasn't it? I nodded. I'd be expelled, and Mola would be in trouble for not mentioning my injuries. Master Arwell isn't forgiving about that sort of thing. The two of you would probably be implicated too. I don't want that. We were quiet for a moment. The only sound was a distant clamor of the busy tap room below. I sat down on the bed. Do we even need to discuss who's doing this? Sim asked. Ambrose, I said. It's always Ambrose. He must have found some of my blood on a piece of roofing tile. I should have thought of that days ago. How would he know it was yours? Simon asked. Because I hate him, I said bitterly. Of course he knows it was me. Will was slowly shaking his head. No, it's not like him. Not like him? Simon demanded. He had that woman dose Kvothe with the plum bob. That's as bad as poison. He hired those men to jump Kvothe in the alley last term. My point exactly, Willem said. Ambrose doesn't do things to Kvothe. He arranges for other people to do them. He got some woman to dose him. He paid thugs to knife you. I expect he didn't even do that, really. I'll bet someone else set it up for him. It's all the same, I said. We know he's behind it. Willem frowned at me. You're not thinking straight. It's not that Ambrose isn't a bastard. He is. But he's a clever bastard. He's careful to distance himself from anything he does. Sim looked uncertain. Will has a point. When you were hired on as house musician at the Horse and Four, he didn't buy the place and fire you. He had Baron Peter's son-in-law do it. No connection to him at all. No connection here either, I said. That's the whole point of sympathy. It's indirect. Will shook his head again. If you got knifed in an alley, people would be shocked. But such things happen all the time all over the world. But if you fell down in public and started gushing blood from malfeasance, people would be horrified. The masters would suspend classes. Rich merchants and nobles would hear of it and pull their children from their studies. They'd bring the constables over from Imre. Simon rubbed his forehead and looked up at the ceiling thoughtfully. Then he nodded to himself, first slowly, then with more certainty. It makes sense, he said. If Ambrose had found some blood... He could have turned it over to Jameson and had him douse out the thief. There wouldn't have been any need to get folks in the Medica to look for suspicious injuries and such. Ambrose likes his revenge, I pointed out grimly. He could have hidden the blood from Jameson, kept it for himself. Willem was shaking his head. Sim sighed. Will's right. There aren't that many sympathists and everyone knows Ambrose is carrying a grudge against you. He's too careful to do something like this. It would point right to him. Besides, Willem said, how long has this been going on? Days and days. Do you honestly think Ambrose could go this long without rubbing your nose in it? Not even a little? You have a point, I admitted reluctantly. 
That's not like him. I knew it had to be Ambrose. I could feel it deep in my gut. In a strange way, I almost wanted it to be him. It would make things so much simpler. But wanting something doesn't make it so. I took a deep breath and forced myself to think about it rationally. It would be reckless of him, I admitted at last. And he isn't the sort to get his hands dirty. I sighed. Fine. Wonderful. As if one person trying to ruin my life wasn't enough. Who could it be? Simon asked. Your average person can't do this sort of thing with hair, am I right? Dal could, I said. Or Kilvin. It is probably safe to assume, Willem said dryly, that none of the masters are trying to kill you. Then it has to be someone with his blood, Sim said. I tried to ignore the sinking sensation in the pit of my stomach. There is someone with my blood, I said. But I don't think she could be responsible. Will and Sim turned to look at me, and I immediately regretted saying anything. Why would someone have your blood? Sim asked. I hesitated, then realized there was no way to avoid telling them at this point. I borrowed money from Davy at the beginning of the term. Neither one of them reacted the way I expected, which is to say, neither one reacted at all. Who's Davy? Sim asked. I started to relax. Maybe they hadn't heard of her. That would certainly make things easier. She's a Galet who lives across the river, I said. Okay, Simmons said easily. What's a Galet? Remember when we went to see the ghost and the goose girl? I asked him. Kettler was a Galet. Oh, a copper hawk, Sim said, his face brightening with realization, then darkening again as he realized the implications. I didn't know there were any of those sort of people around here. Those sort of people are everywhere, I said. The world wouldn't work without them. Wait, Willem said suddenly, holding up his hand. Did you say you're... He paused, struggling to remember the appropriate word in A-Turin. Your loner, your getesur, was named David. His sealedish accent was thick around her name, so it sounded like David. I nodded. This was the reaction I'd expected. Oh, God, Simmons said aghast. You mean demon Davy, don't you? I sighed. So you've heard of her? Heard of her? Sim said, his voice going shrill. She was expelled during my first term. It left a real impression. Willem simply closed his eyes and shook his head, as if he couldn't bear to look at someone as stupid as me. Sim threw his hands into the air. She was expelled for malfeasance! What were you thinking? No, Willem said to Simon. She was expelled for conduct unbecoming. There was no proof of malfeasance. I really don't think it was her, I said. She's quite nice, actually. Friendly. Besides, it's only a six-talent loan, and I'm not late paying her back. She doesn't have any reason to do something like this. Willem gave me a long, steady look. Just to explore all possibilities, he said slowly. Would you do something for me? I nodded. Think back on your last few conversings with her, Willem said. Take a moment and sift them piece by piece and see if you remember doing or saying something that might have offended or upset her. I thought back on our last conversation, playing it through in my head. She was interested in a certain piece of information that I didn't give her. How interesting. Willem's voice was slow and patient, as if he were talking to a rather dim-witted child. Rather interested, I said. Rather does not indicate a degree of intensity. I sighed. Fine. Extremely interested. Interested enough to... I stopped. Willem arched a knowing eyebrow at me. Yes? What have you just remembered? I hesitated. She might have also offered to sleep with me, I said. 
Willem nodded calmly, as if he had expected something of the sort. And you responded to this young woman's generous <laughs> offer in what way? I felt my cheeks get hot. I... I just sort of ignored it. Willem closed his eyes, his expression conveying a vast, weary dismay. This is so much worse than Ambrose, Sim said, putting his head in his hands. Davy doesn't have to worry about the Masters or anything. They say she could do an eight-part binding. Eight! I was in a tight space, I said a little testily. I didn't have anything to use as collateral. I'll admit, it wasn't a great idea. After all this is done, we can have a symposium on how stupid I am. But for now, can we just move on? I gave them a pleading look. Willem rubbed at his eyes with one hand and gave a weary nod. Simon made an effort to get rid of his horrified expression with only marginal success. He swallowed. Fair enough. What are we going to do? Right now, it doesn't really matter who is responsible, I said cautiously, checking to see if my arm had stopped bleeding. It had, and I peeled my bloody hand away. I'm going to take some precautionary measures. I made a shooing motion. You two go get some sleep. Sim rubbed his forehead, chuckling to himself. Body of God, you're irritating sometimes. What if you're attacked again? It's already happened twice while we've been sitting here, I said easily. It tingles a bit. I grinned at his expression. I'm fine, Sim. Honestly, there's a reason I'm the top-ranked duelist in Dahl's class. I'm perfectly safe. As long as you're awake, Willem interjected, his dark eyes serious. My grin grew stiff. As long as I'm awake, I repeated. Of course. Willem stood up and made a show of brushing himself off. So, clean yourself and take your precautionary measures. He gave me a pointed look. Shall young Master Simon and I expect Dahl's top-ranked duelist in my room tonight? I felt myself flush with embarrassment. Why, yes. That would be greatly appreciated. Will gave me an exaggerated bow, then opened the door and made his way out into the hall. Sim was wearing a wide grin by now. It's a date then, but put on a shirt before you come. I'll watch over you tonight like the colicky infant you are, but I refuse to do it if you insist on sleeping naked. After Will and Sim left, I headed out the window and under the rooftops. I left my shirt in my room, as I was a bloody mess and didn't want to ruin it. I trusted the dark night and the lateness of the hour, hoping no one would spot me running along the university rooftops half-naked and bloody. It is relatively easy to protect yourself from sympathy if you know what you're doing. Someone trying to burn or stab me, or draw off my body heat until I lapsed into hypothermia, all those things deal with the simple, direct application of force, so they are easy to oppose. I was safe now that I knew what was happening and kept my defenses up. My new concern was that whoever was attacking me might get discouraged and try something different, something like dousing out my location, then resorting to a more mundane type of attack, one I couldn't stave off with an effort of will. Malfeasance is terrifying but a thug with a sharp knife will kill you ten times quicker if he catches you in a dark alley. And catching someone off their guard is remarkably easy if you can track their every movement using their blood. So I headed across the rooftops. My plan was to take a handful of autumn leaves, mark them with my blood, and send them tumbling endlessly around the house of the wind. It was a trick I'd used before. But as I jumped across a narrow alley... I saw lightning flicker in the clouds and smelled rain in the air. A storm was coming. Not only would the rain mat down the leaves, keeping them from moving around, but it would wash my blood away as well. Standing there on the rooftop, feeling like I'd had twelve colors of hell beaten out of me, brought back unsettling echoes of my years in Tarbian. I watched the distant lightning for a moment and tried not to let the feeling overwhelm me. I forced myself to remember I wasn't the same helpless starving child I'd been back then. I heard the faint drum-like sound as a piece of tin roofing bent behind me. I stiffened, then relaxed as I heard Ari's voice. Both? 
I looked to my right and saw her small shape standing a dozen feet away. The clouds were hiding the moon, but I could hear a smile in her voice as she said, I saw you running across the tops of things. I turned the rest of the way around to face her, glad there wasn't much light. I didn't like to think how Ari might react to the sight of me half naked and covered in blood. Hello, Ari, I said. There's a storm coming. You shouldn't be up on the tops of things tonight. She tilted her head. You are, she said simply. I sighed. I am, but only... A great spider of lightning crawled across the sky, illuminating everything for the space of a long second. Then it was gone, leaving me flash blind. Ari? I called, worried the sight of me had scared her off. There was another flicker of lightning, and I saw her standing closer. She pointed at me, grinning delightedly. You look like an Amir, she said. Quoth is one of the Siri day. I looked down at myself, and with the next lightning flicker, I saw what she meant. I had dried blood running down the back of my hands from when I'd been trying to stanch my wounds. It looked like the old tattoos the Amir had used to mark their highest-ranking members. I was so surprised by her reference that I forgot the first thing I'd learned about Ari. I forgot to be careful and asked her a question. Ari, how do you know about the Siri Day? There was no response. The next flicker of lightning showed me nothing but an empty rooftop and an unforgiving sky. Chapter 24 Clinks I stood on the rooftops with the storm flickering overhead, my heart heavy in my chest. I wanted to follow Ari and apologize, but I knew it was hopeless. The wrong sort of questions made her run, and when Ari bolted, she was like a rabbit down a hole. There were a thousand places she could hide in the underthing. I didn't have a chance of finding her. Besides, I had vital matters to attend to. Even now, someone could be dousing out my location. I simply didn't have the time. Блядь,